Hello everyone and welcome to the introduction to C Sharp programming class brought to you by 3dbuzz.com. Today your lead instructor will be Mr. Nelson Lacay. Nelson. Hello. Hello. I'll also be joining along Jason Busby. Some of you guys know me as Buzz from over there on 3dbuzz.com. Also sitting beside me but unmiked today unfortunately is the lovely Lacey Granger. Hey Lacey. All right. So, just a quick reminder, you are in the Introduction to C Sharp class. That means if you are a skilled programmer, you accidentally came into the wrong room, unless you're planning on just eating popcorn and kind of listening as the show goes on, kind of like, you know, spacing in and out. But this is not an advanced class. This is designed for complete beginners. So please keep that in mind. Next thing I'd like to do is mention BuzzNet. There have been some tweaks and adjustments made to BuzzNet. Nelson, if you could please bring up your notepad or text editor or whatever it is that you're using. There is the address. It is on your screen. Just head on over to buzznet.3dbuzz.com and you can log in with your regular 3 dbuzz credentials. Now, if you are having difficulty getting logged into the system. We have discovered a couple of antivirus applications that will give you a little bit of grief in doing so. Nelson, you want to talk about that real quick? They, they may be wondering why. Are, are we like pumping horrible viruses to their computers? No, BuzzNet uses a relatively new technology called WebSockets in order to be um, a little bit more real time and not so strenuous on the server. Unfortunately, some older versions of antivirus software. My understanding is that the newer ones finally realized that it was a ridiculous idea to block WebSockets, and I think the newer ones got it fixed. But some older ones, specifically an older version of Avast, decides to block all WebSocket traffic for some reason. And so if you're having difficulty logging in, then just go ahead and see if disabling your antivirus software works. And if it does, just find out where in your antivirus software you can put an exception for BuzzNet in. Um, it's nothing bad or evil, it's just I'm using something that some people, some antivirus software freaks out about. Right. Now we should have, well I see a scroll bar over there, so that's a good thing. Nelson, did you also figure out the occasionally jump back up or not continuing to scroll down? I'm just curious myself. Um, kind of, sort of. Kind of, sort of. All right. Well, that may still happen, so just keep an eye, guys. It, it shouldn't happen, um, but unfortunately now, no matter where you're scrolled, it'll always pop you down to the bottom when a new message comes in. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah, that can be fun, too, in an annoying yeah. kind of way. But that's all right. Let's go ahead and continue. All right, next thing I want to mention is, oh, and BuzzNet is not a requirement. It's just if you want to be able to follow along with what's going on in the chat, that is where the chat is going to be taking place. Okay, the next thing I want to mention is recordings. I am recording this webinar session, and I will be putting it up on 3dbuzz.com over in the lounge. I had hundreds of emails asking me for the link last time, and I think I accommodated most everyone. I, I, I tried to stay on top of that the best I possibly could. Um, again, if you just go to 3 Buzz and you go into the forums in the lounge, that's where you're going to find the links. But if you email me, I will do the best I can in getting you know back in touch with you and letting you know. I'll also be tweeting the uh, the thread that contains the link as well as putting it up on 3D Buzz Facebook and my personal Facebook as well. So there you guys go. Um, as far as recording goes, we're going to be recording just the lecture portion of the class because there are so many in this class. If we were to constantly stop and answer questions, it would take us a tremendous amount of time just to get through the lecture that is planned. That would be bad, not to mention people watching the video afterwards would get very frustrated um, with the constant stopping. So we are dividing up just like we did last week. We'll be doing lecture first and then we'll be moving over into questions. So in just a second I'm going to ask if there were any specific questions in regards to last week's lecture, but then all questions regarding today's class, please let's hold that for the second part of the class. Also, for those of you that have been in many of our classes in the past, we will be doing student participation slash interaction, but we will be doing that in the second half as well. So with that, let's go ahead and see if there are any questions from last week. So are there any actual questions? First question up is, did I have to attend last week's class 
to be able to follow along with this week. No, you can jump in and out any time you would like. So there you go. I mean, if you're completely new and you're just now jumping in, you may find things to be a, a bit confusing, obviously, because you, you know, if you don't know what an IDE is and you don't know um, some of the things that we discussed last week, then obviously it will you know, get a little confusing. Okay, so any other questions in regards to will there be any coffee breaks? Yes, there will be coffee breaks, and that is probably the most important question I have ever seen come in. Absolutely. Um, anyone else? Are you doing advanced unity at any time? Yes, Alex, we will be doing advanced unity. I'm wanting to do a, a new introduction to unity class. It's going to be structured differently than we handled it um, last time around. And, and then we're going to use that as our launch pad for moving over into more advanced classes. All right, looking for any more questions? And yes, the, is the first session recording available on 3D Buzz? Yes, it is. So looking really, um, do we have any um, intentions with doing UDK4 um, when it comes out? Yes, I definitely would like to see some UDK4 stuff. Any ideas when you'll be announcing a possible free Unity class? Evo, yes, that's a, a really good question. Um, we're going to wait until next week. I want to see how the attendance holds up for half of this class. And if we've got things going really well, next week uh, we'll go ahead and lock it into, um, into stone. Am I safe using Windows XP, Nelson? Um, no, because Microsoft is going to be stop supporting that in like the next couple months. But yes, it should work fine. Forgotten password retrieval does not work, and maybe somehow gets blocked from Gmail. Um, I've I know people that have had it work just fine. But um, if you want to fire off an email to um, BuzzBJ at 3dbuzz.com, I'll be more than happy to see if I can help you out. It might be getting blocked. Um, and is the Unity course is for mobile too? Well, everything that we're going to be talking in an introduction will also, you know, apply for the mobile stuff in the introduction class. Okay. So most of these questions are questions that we can handle afterwards, uh, meaning after the lecture section. So what I want to do now is talk about this week. So for session number two, today what we're going to be looking at is the world of data types. And we're also going to be moving over into looping so that we have the ability to introduce some more uh, interesting control inside of our applications. So we're going to be taking a look at um, ints, floats, doubles, decimal, um, boolean, strings. We're going to be talking about data type conversions. So we'll be talking about casting, parse, triparse, system.convert, and toString. We're going to move from there into a discussion on value versus reference. This is, a, this is a very important thing to understand. From there, we're going to be talking about arrays and while loops. Nelson, you actually stuck arrays in there? I, I totally missed that one. Wow. No, we did last, uh, last year. OK, well, cool. All right, so that is what we are looking at today. So let's go ahead and get started. Nelson. Alrighty. So last week, we left off with a very simple example of a program that had, a, what, like an if statement in it, or, um, actually, give me one second. I need yeah, to it, was, this it was, I mean, very simple stuff last week, as Nelson is slowly pulling that up. Hey, Nelson, be pulling that up. Um, no, no. No. Okay. Working on it. So for those of you that missed last week, we got into talking about what IDEs are. We talked about compiling and running code via the IDE. Uh, we then went ahead and did a simple hello world and talked about uh, syntax. So we talked about the main method. We talked about keywords, comments, statements, white space, methods, types, and namespaces. I do understand that 95% of all of that is going to be confusing for those of you that are complete beginners. And I had explained last week that that is completely cool. No concerns with that. Um, I'm just wanting to get you guys used to hearing this terminology because you're going to hear it more and more and then we have classes or excuse me sessions in this class that are specifically designed to make sure that you understand what things like methods are. 
So um, from there, we took a look at reading and writing to the console, uh, very basic variables, and very basic flow control with um, if. And then we went ahead and threw else in as well. Right. And we left off with something, an example that kind of looked like this will lead into what we will be discussing today. Actually, for clarity, I am going to go ahead and split. Um, uh, you're not going to let me do that, are you? There we go. Okay, so we had a uh, variable, a simple console output, simple console input, and an example of an expression that involved concatenating a string variable with a string literal and then a read key that pauses the input. So fairly straightforward stuff, but strings aren't the only kind of data we can store. I want to start off today's class talking about the other kinds of bits of data that we can have stored in our application. So if you guys recall, um, when I talked about a variable before, a variable is two things. It's a type and it's an identifier or a name, in this case name. But of course name could be uh, uh, anything that I wanted it to be. I could have named it, um, this is my awesome variable that can have any name that I wish. What are we coding in Objective-C now? That's quite verbose. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not good style but the point is is that I just want to emphasize how much the identifier is something that um, uh, something that can change now something that people will be confused about for a while until they start working on code more often is the, are the naming conventions that I use now the C sharp language has a variety of naming conventions that are used by Microsoft and almost all of them are followed properly uh, by Microsoft themselves. However, there are some pretty immutable naming conventions that we will be using that people should be aware of. We'll be talking about classes and methods in later classes, so I won't go over their particular naming schemes, but it's important to understand the naming conventions of local variables. Again, a local variable is just a place that our program can store data in. So the naming conventions in local variables is basically any, um, any, any valid identifier, which if you guys recall, a valid identifier can start with a letter or an underscore and can be followed by letters, underscores, or numbers. The naming conventions for a local variable are that they start with a lowercase letter and each word is delineated by an uppercase character. Now, I imagine some people might be tempted to put maybe spaces or something in, but because spaces uh, are not allowed in variable names, we cannot do that. So instead, this is what we are going to be using, and this is what I recommend to use in pretty much every single programming language that I've ever used. Um, local variables are named this way consistently. It might seem arbitrary for you right now. You might think, oh, well, sometimes I, I, I want a capital variable name or something like that, but your readability will significantly suffer if you deviate from the very basic naming conventions that have been established by programmers for, I don't know, 40 years, 50 years. Now, Nelson, one of the things you had said just a moment ago is that a variable is two things. It's a type and it's an identifier. Mm -hmm. But I think more importantly for those that are joining us that truly are complete beginners, I think it's very important for them to understand above that is that a variable is a place in memory that can hold data. Right. I mean, that's the purpose of a variable is to contain data. Now, the, the, the type and the name come into play when you wish to access that data or use that data. The name is what we use to refer to the variable throughout our program after we've defined it, and that allows us to put information in. So for example, I'm using the assignment operator right here, stashing the whatever thing that console read line gave us back and putting it in this as a variable. But unfortunately, things are a little bit more complex than that, because right now we only have an example of a variable that can contain text data. 
a string in pretty much every programming language is a data type that can contain text, uh, any arbitrary length text. Um, so an example of a string would be something like what we have right here, which is what I've called referred to before as a string literal. I say the word string literal because it is a value that is literally placed into our program. Whereas this is not a literal, but it still is a string. The reason it's not a literal is because this is logic that happens when your program runs. By, by storing values in variables, we can change the way our program runs every time it's ran. For example, if instead of doing console.readline, I put in the string literal of Nelson, we don't have a very useful program because it can't change at all. Variables, by their definition, allow our program to do different things depending on what the user has typed in or told the program to do. But strings are only one, kinds of one kind of type, or sorry, one type, because there are multiple kinds of type. I'm not going to get into that right now. So a string is one of the types that we have, and a string is built into the .NET framework, and it's built into every single .NET language you would ever use. And again, just to recap, a string contains text. And we can put values into that variable. So this is an example of placing this value into this variable. We are allowed to do this because this value has the same type as this variable. But what if we wanted to do something like this? Let's say we wanted to calculate um, uh, 2 squared. Well, you might want to do some. You might do something like this. You might say, "Oh, my text equals to um, console dot write line my text times my text." This code will not work, and it won't work for a very specific reason. Although technically the syntax is valid in this program, we are not allowed to assign integer literals to strings which brings us into the first type we have at our disposal and one of the most common types you're going to be using in any programming language you might ever want to use. And that is the integer. Integers, again, uh, I'm putting this in for sake of completeness, are a keyword, in this case INT, we know it's a keyword because it is blue, that simply alias out to the system.in32 type. So these are basically the same integers. So I just want to point this out for especially people coming from Java because these are the same thing. We'll get into a little bit more complicated um, uh, delineations between integers and strings later. But the most important one to realize is that integers contain integer data. An integer is any positive or negative whole number. So it can't have a decimal place in it, but it can be any positive or any negative whole number. And by creating a variable where we specify the type as int, we are allowed to place any integer expression or any integer literal into that variable. So in this case, we have the integer literal 10. Now what happens if we were to write this out? You can hit a five and we get the result of 10. Now that's actually very similar to, I just wanna point this out, I could have done this as well. As far as the output's concerned, there's no difference between these two things. But when working with a language like C Sharp, the, one of the biggest mistakes I see people make is confusing different types. Types are important. You always should be able to point out a variable and say, this is an integer or this is a string. So, what we have here is an integer that contains the value of 10, and this is the integer literal 10. Um, again, it's literal because it's hard-coded into my program. So what we can do with integers are a variety of different operators that a lot of people will be familiar with. For example, I could say my integer equals my integer times my integer to square it if I wanted to. And if I were to run this program, I would get 100. So we can do a variety of different mathematical uh, operations to our integers in the way that you would expect them to work. So we could say my integer equals my integer plus 10 subtracted by 50. 
course, that expression can be reduced, but that's not the point. The point is, is that we can perform any sort of arbitrary arithmetic on our integers, and we will commonly do so. Now, I want to point out something that uh, could be a stumbling block for people who are completely new to the concept of variables, because I know a lot of things that people take for granted when they've been programming for a while is that syntax like this is pretty much well understood between all languages. But I have seen people get slightly confused about what could be going on right here. What we have right here is an example of an expression. Now, an expression has a type and a value. The value is the data inside of the, that is the result of the expression, and the type is what, where that data can be placed into. So this expression is, uh, has the value of whatever my integer is, in this case 10, plus 10 minus 50 as the type of int. But what I'm doing with it is very interesting. I'm reassigning it to my integer. The order of operations in C sharp dictate that anything on the right hand side is going to happen first. So what we get is this expression gets ran by the computer and it, what was it, um, negative 30, turned into negative 30, and then we basically have this code here where we say my integer now equals negative 30. The original value of 10 is lost forever. So that is an example of an integer. We can do a lot of fun stuff with it. We will be using integers a lot, especially in this later in this class while when we talk about looping. You might be asking yourself right now how you would ask the user to type in a value that gets turned into an integer. Like for example, let's say we wanted to write a simple program. Um, so like uh, int users value, and then we could say console write um, enter value one about users left value and users right value. And then we can say enter value one, users left value equals console read line, console write enter value two, user write value equals console read line. This is a you know, straightforward thing that someone might try to do after learning about how integers work. And then you might be able to say int result equals user left value plus user write value. Then we could say something like console write line um, user left value plus uh, user write value equals result. And you might try to run this program, but as we have already been made aware by our squigglies here, this is not acceptable. Um, so instead, what you might try to do is think, okay, well, it's saying we cannot implicitly convert type string to int. So I'm seeing the word string there. What happens if I change this to a string? Now we have a problem down here where, well, can I implicitly convert type string to int? So let's go ahead and fix that, and now let's run the program. I've seen people go through this process of trying to write a simple calculator before fixing every single errors with what they guess would be the correct answer. But when we run this and say enter value 1 and enter value 2, we get 43 plus 1 equals 431, which is perhaps the most broken calculator I've ever seen. No, run it again and put like 50 and 10. Yeah. Yeah, now that calculator is really awful. Yeah. So this is, um, <clears throat> this is obviously not going to work. That's why we have different types of variables. That's why we need an integer here. Because what's happening here is we have perfectly valid code where we're receiving that input from the user, we're performing an operation on it, and we're writing it back out. Remember, that's basically what every single program on this planet does as it receives information, performs a calculation, and, and real, back out. And real quick, let me just toss this in there, and this, again, is directed towards our complete beginners. Remember, the reason that you're seeing Nielsen be able to put in a 50 and an 11, and the result that gets pumped out is 5,011, is because since these are string values, and we have this 
this plus between these two strings, we're just simply using concatenation. We're appending to the end. So that 11 gets appended to the end of the 50. So it's 5, 0, 1, 1. Because again, it's just a string. It's when we change that type from a string over to an integer that our plus takes on a new meaning. Right, because types, they, types determine the kinds of operators you can use on them. Now, <clears throat> there is a plus operator available for integers and there is a plus operator available for strings, but they do completely different things. The plus operator when we have strings is called concatenation. The plus op operator when we have integers is called, well, addition. addition. <laughs> <laughs> so what we have going on here is something that I've seen people write when trying to write a basic calculator because they were frustrated that they couldn't get read line to give us back an integer. So let's go ahead and just fix this really fast. I'm going to change all these types to ints. So now I'm working with integers. I've changed user left value, which I'm clicking on so it gets highlighted every time it's used in my program. And I changed user's right value, which again I'm highlighting, to be integers instead of strings. Now that's what we want. We want user left value and user right value to be integers so then we get the addition behavior of the plus symbol. But we have a problem now. We have cannot converse source type string to target type int. This is something that you're going to see a lot. Type conversions are very important to understand. And we'll go into a couple more, or we'll go into a few more interesting type conversions later when we introduce more types. But for right now, know that there are, there's basically a, a particular way within the .NET framework that is something that you're pretty much just gonna have to memorize. Um, that will allow us to go from a string as in text that the user inputted into an integer value. And so we'll start off with the most basic type of conversion that we can do right now. Oh, somebody does ask, why do we put so many plus signs? Um, I do want to point that out. The, the reason we have so many plus signs here is because these plus signs are used as to concatenate these two strings together and these two strings together and these two strings together. The ones that you see that are not um, uh, orange. But this plus sign is inside of a string literal, which means that it gets literally printed out. So when I hit F5, well, I'll get in there because I haven't fixed the code yet, but this would be part of the output. I could have simply, you know, omitted this entire bit if I didn't want to show the text representation of my thing. But remember, because the, this is in quotes, this plus isn't actually an operator. It's a string literal. It could have been for all the compiler cared. It was just I happen to want to put a plus there. So yeah, we, uh, I really want to quickly introduce the first type of a type conversion. There are a variety of other kinds that we'll talk about once we get into different kinds of types. But because integers and converting strings to integers is so incredibly common, I wanted to start off with this and then get into, then backtrack a little bit into different kind of types later. Because I don't want people to forget this. int.parse. Now, you'll notice some crazy stuff going on here. So let me go ahead and um, users text input, break it out a little bit for you guys. Oops. So what we have here is our two lines of code. The first line of code creates a variable called users text input, and it's a type string and we put the value, whatever is returned by console.readline into it. So that results in whatever the user typed in to go into this variable. Now that this line is done executing, we'll execute line 13. What happens is, is the value from user's text input gets passed in to int.parse, and int.parse returns that value into my integer variable. 
int.parse is used for taking a string and turning it into an integer for us. Now you'll notice I, I have some squigglified code here. You might not have it. I believe this is actually a resharper thing, but um, we'll just ignore that. This is an example of a conversion uh, method. It's not something that's built into the language, so it's not something like casting or uh, implicit conversions or explicit conversions. It is a method that we are able to invoke on in our code, just like how we invoke console.readline. Remember how this method performs a specific task and console.write performs a specific task? Well, int.parse performs this task of taking a string and turning it into an integer. So now if I wanted to do this, users text input equals console read line, and then change this to int.parse users text input, I now have a fairly complete program that will do what I want it to do. So if we run through this really quickly, actually I'll run this first and then go through it. So inter value 1, 50, 11, 50 plus 11 equals 61. That's a lot better. And, and leave it there for a second. Go ahead and talk about concatenation one more time so that you can show that plus and the equals, those two literals that you were concatenating, why you did it, because now it'll be easier to see. Yeah. Um, so you just want me to replace this with something yeah. else? Yeah. So yeah, um, this is basically nerd, blah, blah. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. You know, might as well just put hamburger in there, but hey, my compiler doesn't care what I put into it. I just wanted to point out that those plus and the equal signs weren't actually some expression that I was evaluating. They were just string literals, and I can place anything that I want into those string literals. These pluses, on the other hand, are significant, and they're significant because they appear outside of the quotes. But anyway, so that was basically where we were going. Yeah. Okay, so we have a basic program that does something interesting. This is the first example of actually performing arithmetic on input that has been received from the user and is something that people will be doing a lot of if you decide to pursue programming. So I wanted to give a quick rundown of this. I'll walk through the, the code one more time, nope. and then we'll back up and look at some different types. Of now, even code. though we're not um, going to get into this at the moment, Nelson, this program is not a flawless application, correct? Let's say that you no. were commissioned to actually write this incredibly complex program here. You would not want to hand this off to your client as a completed bug-free app, correct? Well, it depends on how much they paid me. <laughs> So yeah, um, just just for sake of um, completeness, in case somebody does, um, and I encourage people to, if they're able to, uh, type this along. Um, but if somebody does and they say, hmm, well, I wonder what happens if I do this and hit enter. And if that's the thir first thought that you had, you should probably be a tester because that's the kind of thinking that you should have when testing programs is how to break it. So if I type in a string and hit enter, Kaboom. Look at that. And this could be absolutely ridiculously insanely terrifying to people. Know that what, whenever you see this, it means that your program gave up. <laughs> <laughs> they called it, it a day that, and it headed out to the bar. So forget it. Yeah, it's, it said, um, it said uh, there's nothing, <laughs> I'm in a position right now where I cannot continue. Yeah, it said and, this user's stupid, I'm going for a beer. Yeah. If you've pretty much, if you ever, if you have Windows and you ever see that little blah 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 has stopped responding, do you want to send this report to Microsoft or whatever? That's because this happened to their program, and we will be definitely getting into um, how to handle these sort of situations um, and what these are later. But I wanted to point this out because I know somebody out there typed in text into the number field and got the screen, and I wanted to show them that yes, this is the screen you will get. So yeah, and I just I just wanted you to bring that up now, so that those that are completely new, that end up typing this in later and then try it, and they're like, oh my gosh, it's all broken. That yes, 
We know it's broken. We will get into exception handling a little bit later in, in this free course. So you guys will learn how to deal with stuff like this. Right now, yep. we're slowly building. All right, continue. So moving forward. Alrighty, so I'm going to hit Shift F5, and that closes down the program because there's nothing more that my program could have done. So let's go ahead and walk through this real fast, and yeah, let's see what we got. So the first two things, actually, for the sake of something that everybody should get in the habit of really doing. Whoops, wrong one. So I'm going to have all of my... especially for people new to programming who are undoubtedly going to end up writing methods that are 10,000 lines long. Um, oh. Declaring your variables at the top is actually a pretty good yes, practice to have. finally said it. Yes, declaring variables. So that is variable declaration that's taking place there. We are declaring these variables shall exist in this method and they shall be able to hold data of the type we have specified and with the identifier we can get back to them easily. Thank you. Yep. And it's good to have them all at the top because, well, otherwise things get really, really, really confusing because, again, if the method's short, then it doesn't matter as much. But I know everybody here, every, every person who's new to programming, including myself, will end up writing methods so long that this is a good practice to get in the habit of. So anyway, um, what we have up here are our variables, and our variables are, again, just a place, uh, just a place to put data that have a particular name. So we have our users' left value, users' right value, users' text input, and result. These two are integers, meaning the only data that these variables can contain are positive and negative whole numbers, and so is result is an integer as well. Whereas this is a string. This user's text input may contain textual data, either in the form of a return from console read line or in the form of a string literal. So th these lines are not actually executable code. They don't really do anything when the program is ran. This right here is the first line of executable code, and this is the first thing that the computer will do once our program runs. And what we have here is, again, just something that we've been playing with quite a bit for the last you know, week and a half now is the concept of writing output into the console. So I won't really talk about that too much. But this is where things start to get interesting. The first thing we do is we take the value of whatever is returned by console.readline and we stuff it into user's text input. The user's text input just now contains whatever we typed into the console in the form of a string. Next thing we have is a user's left value, and again, that's just an arbitrary name I gave it, uh, left value, right value, because I'm doing addition. I mean, it kind of makes sense, right? Um, and what we do is we take the result of invoking int.parse on it, and we pass in user's text input into int.parse. Int.parse needs to know what it's parsing. It's not magic that this code works. This code is, is very explicit. We are explicitly telling the computer that we want whatever value is inside user's text input to be parsed. We don't want the value of what's in the string literal or that string literal or anything else. We just want the string that's inside of this value to be parsed. And that's why we specify it inside of these parentheses. Just like how we specify what we want console.write to write inside of the parentheses. So the parentheses are very important and we'll be talking more about them later once we get into methods. So int.parse is a method that um, takes whatever we give it and returns the integer representation of that string. So int.parse is only going to be taking in a string. Uh, we can't pass an integer into int.parse. If I passed in the integer literal this, we'll get an error because why are we converting that from, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Um, although I could pass in a string literal like that if I wanted to, that would work. Um, so int.parse will take whatever the integer representation of the string is. This is all about converting data. We always have to convert data in some way when we have our programs running because there is no console.readInt method. The only way to receive input from the console is through reading text. 
So we have to convert that text. And that's where this code comes into play. Once this code is ran, user's left value now contains, now the, the words I'm about to use are very significant. User's left value now contains the integer representation of user's text input. It doesn't contain the exact same value, but it con contains the, con the result of a conversion between the string into this integer. So that's what's held inside of this bucket now. Then we do console.writeValue2. And just a quick recap, the difference between write and write line is that write line um, adds in a new line at the end of the message that you pass into it, whereas write doesn't. For prompts, I like to use write because then they allow me to put in my input on the same line as the prompt. So, yeah. Anyway, the next line, we do the same thing. We enter value 2. We receive the textual representation of what the user typed into the console through the console.readline method. We convert it into an integer using the int.parse method. Then we do something fun. We do result equals user's left value plus user's right value. Now this plus is not the same as this plus. And that's something that's going to be very confusing to a lot of people as they continue programming. Things do not necessarily mean the same, even though they might look like they're the same thing in programming. So this plus does not mean the same thing as this plus. This plus is concatenation. The reason we know that this is doing concatenation is because this is a string, or, well, this is an int, but this is a string. If at least one of the values is a string, then we will have a concatenation. If both values are integers, we will have addition. So this expression, again, I want to, I want to really want to um, hone in on that word expression because expressions are incredibly important. This is an expression, which is a value and a type, meaning it has a value. The value is whatever user's left value plus user's right value is, and has a type, which is an integer. Because this expression turns into an integer or has the type of integer, we can assign it to our variable result, which result right now is just kind of a holding tank for us printing it out later. I could have reused user's left value or user's right value to contain the result if I wanted to. In fact, I could have performed the addition inline right here, but I broke it out for um, clarity reasons and to show that using intermediate variables to store data is a very good practice to have, especially when you're learning to program, because it allows you to very easily see the results of each one of your expressions line by line, as opposed to reusing variables that don't have the right names or placing all that logic in line on this expression. And real quick, Nelson, while we're not addressing all the questions that are coming in on the questions panel, we did have one that I, I wanted to just bring up real quick, and that was, we saw what happened if you were to take a string and put a string in um, it, where we were going to run an int.parse. What happens if you do a float value? Same thing. It doesn't know how to parse it. There's no way for it to turn it into, int.parse does not understand any data type other than int. Right. I just wanted, that question was a good one that I wanted you to go ahead and bring up real quick just in case there was anyone out there thinking that int.parse had the capability of understanding and performing truncation. Yep. Yeah, that, yeah that's definitely something that could I mean, <laughs> the whole type conversions really confuse people, so that's why I'm trying to really, even before I get into um, different kinds of conversions, I just wanted to point out the most common way to do conversions just to, while everybody is relatively still fresh and they haven't got bored of me yet, which they very well might have. It's been about 50 minutes. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to drill this into everyone's head real fast. So that is our program. Uh, the final line concatenates a bunch of strings together to produce our output. And our output is whatever is contained in the user's left value, concatenated with the plus sign, concatenated with whatever is in the user's right value, concatenated with an equal sign, concatenated with result. Notice how I'm saying the word concatenate and not 
added to because then it gets confusing between if I'm referring to addition or concatenation because they use the same um, operator. So um, I guess just one more quick thing just to drill this into everyone's head. Um, I am using int.parse here, but I could have simply have used system.int32.parse. It didn't matter. There is no difference. They are the same thing. If you see people who prefer to use int32 or system.int32 instead of the int keyword, know that it's the exact same. In fact, Visual Studio is even highlighting every use of the word, every use of the int keyword as I highlight in 32. Exact same thing. But I definitely do prefer using the shorthanded version of them. So that's a example of a simple program that does some processing, some actual interesting calculations. And again, no matter what you're calculate or no matter what you're trying to accomplish with your program, you are going to end up having to perform calculations and that's pretty much what your program, how your program is going to perform the logic you want it to. And another quick but relevant question was James just asked, so is parse only for int? No. Um, there are a variety of different ways to convert between one type to another type. And um, we're about to jump into some different types that we have that we can play with. And they will have uh, other ways to parse a string into their respective data type. Okay. Alrighty, so that's our simple program and now it's gone. Let's talk about different data types. So again, we've talked about strings. We've talked about integers. We've talked about booleans. Those are the three types we've talked about so far. Um, string contains text, int contains whole positive or negative numbers. Boolean may only contain the values true or false. The next, next up on the list of popular data types that people use are floats. In fact, there are three kinds of floating point types that we can use inside of .NET and we'll talk about the difference between each one of them. But the most basic one that you're going to see the most often, especially for uh, Unity or other game development, is a float. Now a float I'll define a float in a second, but before I do, I want to point out something kind of funny. Just for sake of completeness, I've always shown everybody what the keywords turn into. Now floats are kind of funny. They are actually system.singles. I don't know why they made that differentiation in the BCL, but they did. Um, so again, just for sake of completeness, this C-sharp keyword turns into this .NET type. Nelson, BCL, such a fancy word, and people may have missed the mention of that previously. Um, BCL is the base class library combined with other extensions, depending on where you're writing .NET code on. That is the base functionality that you have access to inside of .NET. All .NET languages allow you to use the BCL and whatever uh, or .NET extensions that have been provided by Microsoft or Mono or whomever. But yeah, so we have uh, system.single my, my other float. It's the same thing as float my float. Now what's a float? You might notice that I, I assigned a number to it and the compiler hasn't complained yet. In fact, I can hit F6 and prove that the compiler isn't going to complain about it. However, the big difference between a float and an integer is that a float can contain any number, positive or negative, including values that have decimal points. But things are going to get a little messy for right now. Um, I should probably start off with doubles. Yeah. Okay. Just ignore that little f suffix right now. <laughs> we'll talk about the uh, the f suffix uh, very soon here. So if you see the f suffix and are freaking out right now, just hang on there for five minutes and we'll get to it. So a float can contain any positive or negative number that has decimal points in it. And the reason it's called a float is because it is a floating point number. 
And what does that mean? That means that it has a point in it that floats left or right depending on the place value of this value or the place value of this variable. Which means we can put a bunch of stuff in it. And I'll talk about precision in a moment here, but for now just know that we can pretty much put whatever number we want into a float. And we can do interesting calculations on floats. Particularly division is a very important operation to perform with floating point numbers as opposed to integers. Integer division loses the decimal point. So for example, if I were to say int my int equals my integer divided by three, console right line my int, and hit at five, notice how we have 14. But if we were to actually divide 42 by 3, we do get 14 because that is actually divisible. Huh, I'm bad at this game. Let's do 7. No, oh, that <laughs> You just made my day. Uh, sorry, guys. Um, that was awesome. <laughs> okay. So now that I've found a denominator that is actually not divisible by the numerator, um, we get the value for. And this is an example of integer division. Um, integer division will lose the decimal point of whatever value that you are dividing. So yeah. Now this has a this has a common term that our beginners are going to hear often. What's that term, Nelson? Truncation. That's right. And you might you might think, okay, well, hmm, integers don't, can't contain decimal points. I understand that. That's just the rule. I mean, there's no there's no understanding that or not understanding that. That's just the rule. Integers cannot contain decimal points. So what would happen if we tried to perform integer division on two numbers that are not divisible by each other? Well, you might think that the computer would round that value. In this case, the if it did, 4 would actually become 5 because as we see here, the actual result of this computation is 4.6 repeating. So this, if it were rounded, this would have turned into 5, but it, it isn't. That's because we have what's called truncation. Truncation is an actually, it's, it's, it's an English word that means chopping off. And what we're doing here is we're chopping off everything that follows the decimal point. We're losing that information. So let's say that instead of having um, Let's say we did something like this. Uh, float my float result equals my float divided by three. And then we did that and hit F5. And hey, look at that. We have some actual um, decimal point action going on with this float. This float does not cause truncation because floats can store data that has decimal points in them. So what we have going on here is a result of a more appropriate use of data types because we're performing division that we know may result in a number that has a remainder and we do not explicitly want the behavior of truncation. We should use a floating point number instead. And that's really, I mean, it's really straightforward. If integers can not contain decimal points, floats can. And I do want to point out that, um, and there, there have been a bunch of questions that I'm, I am going to get to, Jason. I know you're seeing these. and It's all good, man. Are, but I am going to get to it. But first, for the sake of completeness for everyone, I do want to point out one more quick thing. Um, I'm going to rewrite that program that I wrote before with um, floats instead of integers. So I'm going to say float left user value, float right user value, string text value, float result, console write enter your first value. Oops. Oh, what am I doing? Sorry, too much coffee. Uh, you too. I only say that because I, I drank more coffee today than I probably have all week put together. <laughs> yeah. Well, 
Oops. Okay, so let's say 10 divided by 3. Look at that. We get 10 divided by 3 is 3.3 repeating, which is the appropriate answer for this equation. So, like I said before, floats allow us to contain decimal points. They are what we should be using if we are intending on doing division, anything that can result in fractional data that is important to us. But notice that I basically rewrote the exact same program, but with the word int replaced with float. And the point that I wanted to make right here is this guy here, float.parse. It behaves exactly like int.parse, except for it works with floats. If I were to have done left user value equals int.parse, the funny thing about this is this will work. And we'll get to that why this works um, in a moment. But I will lose the fractional point. Or, yeah, lose the fractional point in the form of a format exception. If instead I use float.parse, we are allowed to enter strings that contain decimal points. And as you see, we get the appropriate calculation performed here. So, yeah, I just wanted to point that out because there is a corresponding float.parse. Okay, what is the fractional uh, point, just the decimal place? Yeah, the fractional um, the fractional value, or the word that I used before and can't remember, is anything that follows a decimal point, also known as the remainder. So, yeah, that those are floats. Now we had a question. Why would you want to ever use a float or an integer over a float? And the answer is, is that all data types have limitations. Floats can only store values up to a specific, um, Jason, what's the word I'm looking for? Specific size. Well, the specific size, but a specific Certain amount number of, of bytes that are. Yeah, but a specific number of significant numbers. That was the word I was looking for. <laughs> Wow. Yes, uh, precision. precision. Is that the word you're looking <laughs> the, for? Yeah, yeah. The, the amount of significant numbers in what we can store in a float is limited. Unlike with integers, um, integers will, as long as you can stuff an integer value into an integer variable, and there are times when that's not the case, we'll talk about that later, but as long as you can do that, you will always get the same integer back. Integers will never lose precision. Floats, on the other hand, will. So, for example, actually, I don't. Oh, it does compile good. Um, what's going on here? Well, like I said, floats lose precision. They actually lose data. Not only do they actually lose data, it's very difficult to compare a quality of floats because when you uh, compare the qu a quality of a float, if you want to know if one float equals another float, you typically want to allow some leeway in that the float might contain a very, very, very small fractional unit that we don't care about. So floats when talking about precision and comparison become very difficult and are less reliable than integers. Well, dude, like I said, dude, dude, what? come on. Let's go back to let's go back to office space. Let's go back to the, a bank application. Um, even though we're not looking at small fractions of a cent, you just lost me forty three cents. <laughs> well, yeah, that's um, that's that's all. That actually adds up a lot. I mean, that's you know, that's almost half a dollar. What's wrong with you, man? Yes, which brings us into uh, the other floating point numbers that we have available to us. Because a float isn't the only floating point type that we have. We have two more. But now, I real quick, because Evo asked a great question. Is that truncation or rounding? 
Um, this is going to be rounding. So let me see if I can. I forgot how many. What the? How many significant digits? Yeah, there we go. We get some bizarre results. Now, now you um, looks like you gave me some money. I like your program sometimes, and I hate it at other times. There we go. Here's a better example of round, rounding. As you see right here, the fractional unit is 0 0.732. It gets rounded up to have a 1 at the end. Um, we'll talk about the suffix very soon here. So I just wanted to point out to everybody who is listening and everybody who asked, if floats can do all the same things in scan, then why don't we always use floats? Well, floats and other floating point values are not reliable or easy to compare. They do break down. And if you've ever written or worked with a game, a video game engine and tried to run so far away from the origin that your floats start to break down, that's a huge trip, actually. It's kind of fun. Um, so yes, floats will break down eventually because they can only store X amount of significant digits. But like Jason said, um, there are, or pointed out, there are a lot of times where we need floating point values, but we need more precision than what floats can contain. So you guys remember how when I talked, because I've always been doing this with all the types we talked about, I've been showing you guys what the keywords actually alias into. A single is a float. Now, I think that's kind of silly why that's called single, but it's kind of funny because there is, that leads us into the next data type. There's another data type that allows us to contain twice as much um, precision as a float, and it's conveniently named double. Now, for everybody who's been talking about or asking me about this f suffix, notice how I don't have it here. Again, I'll explain the f suffix very soon. Look at that. A double contains twice as amount of the amount of precision as a float. All the same rules that floats and doubles, or that floats have, doubles have. Also, doubles have their own dot parse method. So for example, I could say double stuff and things equals double dot parse blah if I wanted to. Doubles do have a parse method. So again, a double is a floating point number that has twice the precision as a float. It can store twice as many significant digits. So let's throw some more significant digits inside of here and see if we can break a double. It's not easy. There we go. Um, and then just to prove that it is rounding again, I know I've already done this, I'll turn this into 772. And we see it's rounding. Okay, so I've now gotten to where a double has lost all of its precision. That is not acceptable for some sorts of applications, especially financial applications. Now, a float is more than unacceptable. If you're using a float to store money or any sort of financial information, you should, that is not you should, good. You should be shot, yes. Yeah, it just it isn't good at all. Um, doubles, on the other hand, are better, but ooh, we did get a really good question that I'm going to talk about later. Doubles are better, but only twice as good. And they still result in issues with financial applications. That's why with .NET, Microsoft introduced one more floating type value, or one more floating type type, floating point type, sorry, that has double the precision of a double. And no, that's not called a quadruple, it's called a decimal. We'll talk about the M suffix very soon. <laughs> so now we have a float that is being rounded, a double that is being rounded, but our decimal is allowed that many significant digits. And let's try to break a decimal. Oh, come on. I 
broke the compiler. <laughs> okay, we broke the decimal. Uh, let's add one more significant digit. Here we go. Here's the example I want. So, in this case, we have a float, a double, and a decimal. Notice how now they're all being rounded, unfortunately. But this is acceptable for even financial uh, software. Because if you've got that kind of money, you don't care. <laughs> you just don't care. Yeah, I, I'm so tempted to count how many zeros there are, but no. there's probably more money in the world. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. Um, decimals are what you should use for financial accuracy. And accuracy with anything that has to do with financials are, is very important. So... Those are the three floating point types that we have. All they differ, they, they behave the exact same way, but they differ in how accurate they are. Now there's a question coming in that's been coming in over and over and over again. And that is, why would we ever use a float, a double, or a decimal? And I think it's about time to go on break, Jason. Well, don't leave us on a cliffhanger. Why would we use it? Well, that was actually kind of the intention. But what? All right. So just because we had the request earlier, it shall be time dun, 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 for coffee. All right, so let's take a quick 10-minute break. Get your butts up from your seat. Stretch your legs. Do something like pet a kitty. Get some coffee or use the bathroom. And then in 10 minutes from now, let us continue, and I shall pause the video now. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now back from the break, and it is time to continue with this awesome class. Let's do it. Alrighty. So... I left you guys on a cliffhanger. Yes, you did. Um, like I said before, the .NET, all .NET languages provide us with a variety of different data types. Three of them can contain floating point data. However, again, like I've described, there are many reasons to use an integer over a floating point value if you can get away with it. So what we have here are three different things that do a very similar thing or three different types that do a very similar thing. We have floats that can contain floating point data to this much precision, or more specifically, something like that is one, I believe that's going to be, no, there we go. That is one significant digit too many. This is one significant digit too many, and that is one significant digit too many. Just to give you guys the, whoops, there we go, better example. So that's an example of those three data types having one significant digit too many, and then we have rounding happening. So why would we want to use a float versus a double versus a decimal? That brings us into a small discussion about memory. Now, memory is something that we will be talking about a lot, and we'll be getting into it in great detail once we get into week four when we start talking about methods and call stacks and all that fun stuff. But I want to point out to everyone, and this discussion will round us, actually bring us back into integers because there are concerns about integers that we also have. Um, I, want, I want to point out to everyone that memory on computers is not finite, or is, <laughs> is not infinite. It go. is finite. Um, we only have so much memory on any given computer. For example, if I were to open up my local computer's task manager and look at my performance, you'll see that I have 12 gigabytes of memory installed, and all of my current running applications is taking about that much of it, taking about 4.6 gigabytes. Every time that we have a variable, it must be stored somewhere on our computer's memory. Computers do, are not magical. There's nothing magical about computers. They're actually really just oversized calculators when you get down to it. And they have to store your data somewhere. And that where your data gets stored is called your memory. This float value can only contain these many significant digits because this float value only has or only requires four bytes of memory. A float value only requires four bytes of memory. It only takes up four bytes of memory on your computer. If you were to put this value inside of a file, it would only take four megabytes of me or four, sorry, bytes of memory on that file. 
A double has twice as, requires twice as much memory. A double requires eight bytes of memory, and a decimal requires uh, 128 bits divided by eight. I can't do math anymore. You're, you're failing epically. Uh, That's okay. Continue. Yeah, whatever that value is. Uh, decimal, I believe it contains uh, eight bytes, or uh, sorry, uh, 16 bytes of memory. Um, sorry, coffee, coffee. Coffee. Um, so yeah, we have an example of three types that all contain twice as much memory as the type above them. So the reason you might want to choose a float, double, or decimal depends on the requirements of the software you are writing. We are not going to be really getting into the specifics of performance or other sorts of concerns that you will run into when you have large amounts of applications but I wanted to point out that that is the difference. They require different amounts of memory in order to work. Um, so yeah, so we have floats, doubles, and decimals. And the only difference is how much memory they take up and their precision. So let's talk a little bit, uh, if, that's, uh, if that's a good enough explanation. Uh, Explanation, Jason. Yeah, I mean, again, from a completely beginner point of view, that's fine. Yeah, because we will be talking about things like call stacks, because I could certainly bust out the whiteboard and talk about how memory is allocated inside of main and all that fun stuff. But that's going to be a topic we will dive very deep into on week four. So, all right, so we have floats, doubles, and decimals. And People have been asking over and over and over again, what's up with these suffixes? In this case, I have a suffix of F. In this case, I have no suffix. And in this case, I have a suffix of M. And that gets into the concept of implicit conversions and explicit conversions and how C Sharp converts one data type to another data type. So before I actually define what these Fs and Ms are, I want to talk about the conversions between an integer and a floating point number. Inside of C Sharp, C Sharp is a very safe language. It was designed by Microsoft to be very safe and to prevent you from doing things that you don't want to do. If you ever read any of the blogs of the uh, language designers, or people who worked on the C Sharp language itself, their justification for virtually every feature is, does this prevent a person from making a common mistake? In that regard, they made the type conversions of C Sharp very safe, and they follow some very basic general rules. For example, this is allowed. Remember, this right here is an integer literal. I could have written this code like this. And it would still work. The point is, is that I'm assigning the value of this expression, which is in this case a variable reference, to the value of a float. This is an integer being turned into a float, and this is an example of an implicit conversion. Implicit conversion means a conversion. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to say this without basically repeating the definition, but I'll go ahead and say it anyway. An implicit conversion is a conversion that is ha happens implicitly. Implicitly means we don't tell the C Sharp compiler we want this to turn into a float. It just figures out, well, we're, we're stuffing an int in a float, so pro the developer probably wants to convert this to a float. This conversion is allowed, and as a result is an implicit conversion. However, this conversion is not allowed. We cannot go from a float to an int. Even though this float technically contains a perfectly valid integer, when this expression happens, this integer is converted into a float and stored in this float variable. When this line happens, we're trying to take this float variable and take its value out, which is 10 in this case, and put it into this my other int variable. We are not allowed to do this. The reason we are not allowed to do this is because there is no implicit conversion between a float and an or from a float to an int. And the reason that there isn't follows the basic guidelines that I was talking about before with C Sharp trying to be a very safe language. When we go from an int to a float, 
it's not very possible for it, it's. I'm just going to make a blanket statement, though it's technically wrong, but I don't want to get into the caveats. When we go from an int to a float, we don't lose any information. A float can contain integer values and decimal values and all that fun stuff. We don't lose any information when we go from my int variable to my float. Nothing, nothing will get lost. No information will get truncated. But when we go the other way around, because a float can store data that an integer cannot store, we get an error. This error is not arbitrary. This error is a decision that the C-sharp designers made specifically about conversions from floats to integers. Their reasoning is a float can potentially contain data, such as in this case, that cannot be converted into an integer. We cannot convert 10.4 blah 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 into an integer because we will lose all of this information. And C Sharp being a safe language, they wanted to prevent people from accidentally losing information. So that brings us into the second type of conversions. And those are explicit conversions. So like I said before, there is an implicit conversion between integer variables or integer values and float variables. This is all implicit. This is implied. This is built into the language. You can do this all day long. There is no implicit conversion between floats and ints. But there is an explicit conversion. And we specify explicitly to the c -sharp compiler that we want to perform an explicit conversion by using this syntax. This is known as casting. By opening up a parenthesis, putting in a type, and closing a parenthesis, and then following that by an expression, we are explicitly telling the c -sharp compiler we want, we explicitly want, we know the consequences, we know what could potentially happen that would be bad. We know we might lose information, but we don't care about it for some reason, and we want our float to turn into an integer. This is an explicit conversion. So remember, there are, as a rule of thumb, there are implicit conversions between every type in C-sharp that will not result in the loss of information. And there are typically explicit conversions between numeric types that could potentially cause um, a problem. So there are a variety of other implicit and explicit conversions available in the .NET language. Um, for example, eh, I'm not going to get into that quite yet. But so what we have here is an example of, like I said, an implicit and explicit conversion. Eh, that's really about all I can say about that. But now I want to finally answer that question. Why is there an F right there? There's an F right there because this 23 or 232.32 is not a float. It is a double literal. So remember, I've talked a lot about literals. We have string literals. We have integer literals. We have double literals. And so on. So, and what well, well, we, we also have uh, like false, which is a Boolean literal. Because according to the C sharp specification, any value or any literal that has a decimal place in it is a double literal. That means this 232.32 is not a float, it is a double. And if you guys remember what I've been talking about before, where typically there's always going to be a implicit conversion between two types that will not result in the loss of information, but the same is not true the other way around. The C sharp compiler says, okay, well, we have a double right here. We know it's a double because it's a 232.32, and per the language specification, this is a double literal. But well, we're trying to stuff this value into a float. And we, as the C sharp compiler, know that a double can potentially contain more precision than a float can handle. We will disallow the implicit conversion. Now, I want to point out two things. There's two ways to make this code work. There is 
a explicit conversion between doubles and floats. By the way, I can prove this is a double literal by ho hovering my mouse over it. Notice how it says down there in the little pop-up window, struct system.double. What we're doing here is we're saying, okay, we know we have a double value, but we don't care if we lose some precision when converting into the float, so we will tell the C-sharp ex compiler explicitly that we want to perform this conversion, and this is an explicit conversion. It's explicit because it's explicit. <laughs> this is me explicitly telling the C-sharp compiler to do something. And so it's allowing me to do it. There's another way to write this code that is much nicer, and that is any value, whether it be an integer literal or a double literal, that has an F suffix is turned into a float literal. This f is not a function. It isn't a conversion. It isn't a cast. It is syntax that's built into the C-sharp language that says, if any number has an f immediately following it, it will be considered by the C-sharp compiler to be a float literal. So, which means I can remove this cast right here, and I can put an f at the end, and now this code works. And if I hover over this, Notice how it says struct system dot single. And remember, singles are the same things as floats. Because this is now a float literal, it can be assigned to a float value. So you also noticed I had this decimal value too. And at first I did something like that. Now, in C sharp, this is one of the exceptions to the rules. I don't know why they did this, or I don't, I'm not saying rule as in rule. I'm saying, remember how I said that typically the C-sharp compiler will let anything be implicitly converted if no loss of information can happen? This is an exception to that. I don't really know what the justification on the C-sharp compiler teams was to disallow this implicit conversion, but they did. I cannot take a double and implicitly convert it into a decimal. Now I can explicitly convert it into a decimal if I wanted to by using a cast, but I cannot implicitly convert it into a decimal. So fortunately, we don't have to do this. The C-sharp compiler introduce, introduces the M suffix. The M suffix specifies that the number that it is in front of should be treated as a decimal literal. So what we have here are the F and the M suffixes that change the way the C-sharp compiler understands a particular number literal. There's also one more, but it's really redundant. You can also add a D suffix. So let's go ahead and you can add a D suffix if you wanted to, for whatever reason. Um, now, the only reason, I mean, because you already know I've said that if you don't have any suffix and there is a decimal point inside of it, that it is treated like a double. A D is kind of redundant, but not in cases where you wanted to have a decimal literal that didn't have a decimal point inside of it. So for example, notice how I don't have a decimal point. Normally, this would be an integer literal because I don't have a decimal point. And I can prove that by taking the suffix off and hovering my mouse over it and it says struct system.in32. But if I add that D suffix into it, and now it gets turned into a double. So those are the suffixes. We have F, M, and D. And they allow us to, they're not conversions, they're not casting, they're not methods. They instruct the C-sharp compiler to treat a number as if it were a literal in a different type. So, I mean, is there anything you wanted to add to those uh, suffixes? No, that's actually quite thorough. Alrighty. Um, yeah, and if you want to screen grab this, then you can, because these are the different kinds of literals that we've talked about. and. 
yeah, and I really want people to understand the word literal, especially because it will appear in many error messages depending on what you're doing. Okay, so we've talked about implicit conversions and explicit conversions, um, but like I said before, um, let's say we wanted to have a string called my string and we make it equal to 10. And then we have an int my int equals my string. This is not going to work. The reason it's not going to work is because there is no implicit conversions between integers and strings in C sharp. In fact, there are no explicit conversions between integers and strings in C sharp. C says cannot cast expression of type string to type int. Now you might be wondering, well, why don't they add that ability in? The reason is that it's not that strings can potentially contain more or less data than an int. It's that strings may potentially not even be an int at all. Because of that, the c -sharp compiler team decided to not allow the implicit or explicit conversions between strings to integers or any other numeric or Boolean type. So how do we do this? Well, you guys have already actually seen the answer to this. We have a variety of parse methods. So we can say int.parse, my string. Int.parse is not a cast. It isn't an implicit conversion. It isn't an explicit conversion. It is a conversion though, but it's done through the invocation of a method. This method understands how to take strings and turn them into integers. If you guys want to see something terrifying, give my screen a moment here after going white for some And reason. if you didn't want to see anything terrifying, too bad. <laughs> I, this wasn't what I meant as terrifying, but for some reason it looks like my net connection is going a little bit slow. I just want to point out, here we go. This parse method is actually something that is, uh, it's actually code that is part of the BCL. It isn't a part of the language technically. It's part of the BCL. And it's a method that we are allowed to use to turn a string into an integer. And there's a variety of them. We can do int.parse, so let, let's go through them. Um, let's do string one equals one. And then I want to say console.writeline int.parse one. We can do console.writeline float.parse one, double.parse one, decimal.parse one, boolean.parse one. Um, I think those are all the types that we've talked about. I think the boolean will actually, there, yep, it'll fail because boolean.parse only works with words true or false. So let me go ahead and say string my true equals true and do bool.parse my true. So there are a variety of different parse methods on each one of the basic types that we can use. So yeah, um, those are the ways that we can actually go about taking a string and turning them into numeric types. But sometimes these fail. I'll get to that last because that gets into some complicated syntax. Instead, I'll talk really quickly about system.convert. There's a method, there's a class called convert. It's available underneath the system namespace. We have things like 2int32 or 2single or whatever we want. Now, the convert, the difference between convert and parse is that parse only accepts strings. Now I'm showing you guys these method signatures. I don't expect you to understand them, but I do expect you to at least pull out one bit of information right here. And that is that it's saying string right there. Parse only accepts strings. Whereas if I did a convert dot to, so let's say instead of doing int dot parse one, I did convert dot two int 32 and I passed in one. The difference is, is that a convert can go from 
a variety of different things. Again, I don't expect you guys to understand the method signatures, but I do want you to take a look at what we have right here in this listing. We have things like booleans and bytes and characters, which we haven't even talked about, date times and decimals and doubles and floats and ints and longs and objects. Just a bunch of different things that we can go from to in 32, whereas a parse only goes to a string. Why would you want to use a parse? Well, there's a couple of reasons. First of all, parse provides um, a different kind of parse method, which we'll get to, that is useful when detecting if something is valid or not. And second of all, parse is slightly faster, and third of all, I think it looks prettier. So yeah, I just wanted to point out, you will see int.parses, and you will see convert.2int32s. They do pretty much the same thing, there are just a couple differences. Again, the biggest one is that 2int32 supports a variety of more different kinds of types to convert from and to. So is there anything more about um, int.parse and convert? other than the whole try thing no. that you want to add? No, I think that's good. I think we can go ahead and move on over to try now. Okay, this is going to terrify people. Of course, after you're done typing it out, just for our beginners, spend just a second and walk through the lines that you just threw up at a million miles an hour. All right, first I'll just go ahead and run the program just so you guys can see what it does. It says, enter your age. I can put in 21, hit enter, and it says in five years you will be 26. What this program does is the first thing it does is it declares three variables declares your age and result as integers. Again, I don't want to accept fractional ages, mm -hmm. so I chose integer instead of floats or doubles or decimals. And then it contains a temporary variable I'll use just to make my code a little bit clearer called text input. First thing it does on the first line of executable code, remember this isn't technically executable code and we'll get to that um, in week four. Um, console.write will display a little prompt to the user. The result of console readline will be stored in text input. The result of taking text input and converting it into an integer through using int.parse will be stored in your age. Result will be the value of your age plus five. We know this is addition because both of these operands or both of these things on either side of the plus are integers. So we know that this, this plus is doing addition, not concatenation. Then finally, we say right line in five years, you will be result. And well, uh, well technically, finally, we wait for the user to hit a key, but I'm just kind of ignoring that line. So again, if I run this program, hit 21, five years, it would be 26. So base, basic stuff here. But we have a problem. We have a big problem. input string was not in the correct format. This is that error that we got before where our computer basically gave up trying to do what we wanted it to do. Let's go ahead and fix that. And we're gonna fix that with some absolutely terrifying syntax that is going to freak everybody out. I'm just going to keep that being true. How about text input? Okay, so now if I entered in <laughs> um, 21 is not a number, read the instructions. 
So we have introduced two crazy things into our program. One of them is the if statement, which we've talked about last week, but didn't get into too deeply. And the next thing is the use of int.tryParse. int.tryParse has the most complex syntax of a method invocation that you guys are going to be seeing for a while. And that's because it has what's called an out modifier on your age. The out modifier, without going into details about it, is required if it's required and not required if it's not. Some <laughs> There is a very, very specific reason why the out modifier is required here. And we know it is because the documentation tells it that tells us that it is. The documentation says right there that we need an out. If we didn't provide an out, you would get an error. Well, we get two errors, but ignore this one. Uh, this error says argument value while parameter is declared as out, which means that the argument that we passed in is not decorated in the way that this method wants us to decorate it as. If you see this error, you can fix it by placing an out modifier immediately before your argument. So this out has caused so much headache to everybody who's ever used it for the first time, especially if they're new to programming. And I'm kind of sad that I have to introduce it so early into everything. But unless you want your program crashing every single time you type in a, a type in text instead of a number, you will have to use a method such as tryparse. Now, what does tryparse actually do? Well, tryparse takes in two parameters and it returns a Boolean. The two parameters it takes in is first, text the input that you want to parse, the string you want to turn into a number. The second parameter is the variable you want that parse result to be stuffed into. What we're saying is, is we're saying, if you are successful in parsing this text, if you can take this text and turn it into a number, then stuff that number in the your age variable. The next thing that tryparse will do is it will return a boolean indicating if it succeeded or failed at parsing. I can prove that by doing this. I can say did parse correctly. And now you see that I'm using, well, just for um, consistency reasons, I'll Put it up there. What we see here is an example of us taking the result of triparse and storing it into a boolean for later use. Now this is a longhand way of doing it. I could have put the int dot triparse inside of these parentheses like you saw me do at first, but I broke it out because I just really want to make people aware that an if statement is not magical. What goes inside the parentheses is simply any expression that turns into a boolean. And a variable reference that is a boolean does turn into a boolean. And we are allowed to store booleans in boolean variables. So again, int.tryparse does two, three things, or has three aspects to it. A, it needs to know what text it is trying to parse. B, it needs to know what variable we want the result of that parsing to be, and C, it needs to tell us if it was successful in parsing. And and at this point in time, in all honesty, for our beginners, that's all you really need to know. I know the syntax is going to look a bit scary, because now we have a method that takes in two parameters, not to mention that we're using that keyword out to make things even more confusing. But as long as you understand what those two different parameters that we're sending in are being used for, you're in good shape. And that the whole try parse method itself is going to return true or false if it was able to successfully parse whatever was in that first parameter, in this case, text input. Right. I did actually, I think you actually did point out something that I kind of forgot to point out to people who might be completely new is we are taking multiple parameters. The way we specify, or we are taking multiple arguments, the way we specify multiple arguments is by delineating them with a comma. This comma is significant. If you don't have this comma in, 
you will get a compiler error because the C-sharp compiler will get confused. You have to tell it where one argument ends and the other one begins. Alrighty, so that is triparse. Triparse allows us to, um, well, try to parse something. And let we, we'll come back to this once we've covered scope and once we get into writing methods and, and reviewing scope, variable scope within methods, then we'll come back to try parse and we'll explain it again. And at that point, I promise it will make a lot of sense. At the moment, it's kind of one of those, you know, believe us, it's going to work. Why? Because look, it's working. Ta -da. Right. And I don't, and one other quick thing, I don't want people to start stuffing out everywhere. Again, like I said before, it's required when it is, it's not required when it isn't. And it will cause errors if you try to place it in places that it shouldn't be, like right there. If you're ever curious as to whether or not you need an app modifier, read the errors. That's actually one quick little shout out I do want to do before we move on. Read the errors. I I can't count how many times, because I've been on, on the 3D Buzz forums for years. Nine years? Yeah, many years. Yeah. And I've seen a lot of people come into the C Sharp forums or the C forums and ask questions. And they say, oh, this, this isn't working. I'm getting a compiler error. And that's it. And then a person will say, okay, what's the error? Then they'll copy and paste the error into the thread. Then a person will literally copy and paste the error into their reply, and then the original poster will be like, oh, that's what's wrong. <laughs> Read the errors. Um, errors are very, very, very good to understand. If you have, if you ever need an out and you do not put it there, you will get an error that explicitly says argument is value while parameter is declared as out. So put an out there. If you see an error, like if I took off this semicolon, look at that, it says semicolon expected. I don't know how that can get any clearer. So definitely read the errors. <laughs> yeah, they are definitely not like C++ compiler errors. I think the C++ compiler was specifically engineered to be the most obscure error generator available on this planet. So, yeah, that is the concept of casting, explicit conversions, implicit conversions, and parsing. So, there's one more thing that I kind of put in there that I don't know about yet, quite yet, Jason. Reference and value? Yeah, yeah, that one we'll hold off on. I, I think that's kind of important that we do that with a different foundation. Right. So, yeah, we have a program here, and it does awesome things. But we have a problem, actually. Let's, let's, enter, let's go with looping first, because looping is very, very nice and allows us to write programs that are a lot more complex than what we have right here. If I hit F5, we have a problem. It says, bleh is not a number, read the instructions. And then the program quits. The end. That's not a very good user experience for whoever's using your program. What we need to do is we need to find a way to run this code over and over and over again until we decide it is time to leave the program. So what we're going to do is we're going to introduce a new construct called while loops. I'm going to introduce the infinite loop first because it's the simplest loop to understand. What I've done here is I've wrapped every single bit of code inside of our program except for our variable declarations and our console read key in a while loop. A while loop is a loop, a um, construct that starts with the keyword while, and we know it's a keyword because it's blue, followed by parentheses, followed by, hey, look, that looks kind of familiar. And yes, it does take a very similar, it takes, in, in fact, the exact kind of thing that an if statement does. Then we open up a block. Just like we do with if statements, we, we have to, the C -sharp compiler does not know if this code belongs to a while loop 
unless we tell it that it belongs to a while loop. And again, the C-sharp compiler does not care about new lines or tabs or anything like that. The only way for C-sharp to know that we want this code to be inside of this while loop is to explicitly declare it using our curly braces or our block. So everything inside of this block is associated with this while loop. And this while loop simply says while true. So let's see what happens. We have five. It says enter your age. It says blaze on number, read the instructions. I can put in woe, I can put in hey, I can put in Nelson, I can put in stuff. And check this out. It's repeatedly asking me over and over and over again for me to enter my age. So it's doing this because a while loop starts off the top of this block, executes every single line of code inside of the block. Once it reaches the block, it goes all the way back to the beginning of the block and then starts running the code again. If the expression is true. Yeah. And well, I, yeah, I'm getting... well I, uh, that's important. And of course it's true in this case because Nelson has literally said it's always true by typing in true. Right. So that introduces us to a problem. So this is good behavior. I like this behavior. I like the fact that every time, no matter how many times I input bad data, it will ask me again and again and again. So that's good. But what happens when I put in valid data? So I put in 45 and it says in five years you'll be 50. But now it's asking for my age again. And I've already told it my age. That's I, I don't like this behavior at all. The program should be done now. Now that I've given it the input that it wanted, it's given me the output that I wanted. I want the program to go away, but instead it's asking me for my age again. In fact, because computers never get tired, never get bored, um, don't have emotions, and will do everything you tell them to and nothing more, I can sit here forever until the sun explodes, typing in numbers. That's not the behavior that I want. What I want to happen is I want to write this program in such a way that when I do manage to enter valid data, I want the program to stop. So how do I do that? Well, while loops allow us to put in a condition here, very similar to if statements. I can put in any, th any expression in here that evaluates into a Boolean. I actually already have a fancy little boolean hanging around here that I kn that tells me if I've parsed the input correctly, which means I can actually reuse this boolean inside my while loop. Now, what, I'm about to type this in, but it's going to cause an error. Don't panic. This is <laughs> this is going to cause an error, and it's causing an error because of a slightly esoteric topic of the C-sharp language specification called definite assignment. The goal of C-sharp is to prevent you from making common mistakes, or that's one of the big goals. And what I've done here is I've tried to access a variable before I've given it a value. If we look at the error, it says local variable did parse correctly might not be initialized before accessing. And the C-sharp compiler will prevent this code from compiling until I correct this problem. And again, read the errors. It says use, this error says use of unassigned local variable did parse correctly. So what I have to do is I have to give my did parse correctly a default value. And I'm going to give it a default value of false. Or, sorry, whoops, I'm getting kind of backwards here. There we go. Boolean logic is hard. Alrighty, so what we've done here is we've given did parse correctly the value of false. And we've specified in our while loop that we want to say while did parse correctly is equal to false, execute this loop. And continue to execute this loop until did parse correctly becomes anything other than false. And once it becomes anything other than false, end the program. So now when I hit a five, it says enter your age. I can put in as much garbage input as I want. The program will not crash. 
until I put in a valid number. And when I put in a valid number, it gives me that output that I wanted, and it ends the program. So here we have, again, um, <laughs> another example of the equality operator. It looks like there, there's still some confusion about that. The equality operator is an operator that will evaluate to true if this thing equals this thing. It is a completely different operator than the assignment operator, which is used for assignment. So this assigns the value false to the variable did parse correctly, whereas this compares the value did parse correctly to the value false. While did parse correctly is equal to false, we will continue our loop. One of the most common programming mistakes I see with people who are writing in other languages like PHP, JavaScript, or, or C is that they'll do things like that. And what we'll get right here is code that does actually compile for a particular reason, but we will also get a, um, a nice little squiggly resharper will tell me that this is not what I want. In addition, if I were to run this program, it wouldn't even enter the while loop. So it's important to understand that there is a difference between the assignment operator and the equality operator. So again, here's an example of we had a problem. We wanted to be able to run this logic as many times as it took until we successfully presented the user with the output they wanted. And we solved it by looping, which again, just goes line by line by line by line until it's the end and then it goes back up here. Then it checks to see, is this condition still true or false? If it's true, we'll continue and go through the loop again. Then we'll hit the end, then we'll jump back up, then we'll test, is this condition true yet? Or is this condition false yet? If it ends up being false, then we exit the while loop. When we exit the while loop, we jump all the way from the beginning of the block to all the way to the end of the block and skip everything in the middle. Jason. Yeah. So how are you feeling about loops? Have you learned about loops yet? Uh, I don't know, man. They're confusing. No, that's good. OK. While loops are, or looping in general, whiles are not the only types of loops, and we'll get into other kinds later. Um, looping in general and conditional logic is pretty much the only control flow that you need in order to write virtually any program. Um, you can do a lot of stuff with this approach that we have. Let me throw up another example real fast. I, well, I kind of want to leave this to homework. Do you know what I'm thinking about doing, Jason? I think I have an idea. But it's a good example of a while loop, and I do want to make it very clear to everybody. I'm kind of, um, I'll, I'll be mentally back with you in a second, Nelson. Right now I'm responding to someone who's very, very mad at me because they can't get connected to the webinar. And um, we've got tons and tons of people successfully connected. It's out of my hands. It's a service by Citrix, so just trying to explain that. So continue. Alrighty. Um, yeah, I was doing something. What was I doing? I was doing this. Okay. Entered money equals decimal dot triparse console dot read line. I'm throwing in a little bit of a curveball there by inlining this. I hope I've put this out into its own string variable enough times 
that you guys can mentally see that what's happening here is this code is returning a string and that string is being fed directly into triparse instead of being aliased out into a variable. Okay, so here's the first part of our program. We say while has entered money equals false. Console write, please enter how much money you have. We enter how much money we have. Once, if we did not enter a valid amount of money, we write an error message and we continue the loop. But now I'm gonna introduce a second loop. And this is going to be, um, it's gonna be another little bit of a curveball. While money is greater than zero which, again, it must be definitely assigned, so I have to assign it up here to zero. So when money is greater than zero, what we wanna do is we wanna ask the user to make a particular selection. So I'm going to place a integer up here called menu selection. And I'm going to say console.writeline Please enter your selection. Now, I'm going to simplify this a little bit because I want people to finish this program for homework. Yeah, no kidding. No kidding what? That, that Pepsi's pretty expensive. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Again, I'm leaving, I'm purposefully leaving some bits out. And while you're typing that in real quick, Gabe asks if the Q&A is going to be attached to the video that I'll be uploading and the answer is no. Sorry about that. We're going to give away the lecture and all for free, but the Q&A is um, made available to those of you guys that are attending because keeping attendance up is, you know, obviously really important. So we want to be able to give you guys something um, so that, you know, attendance isn't just two people and everybody's waiting to download. Take care, Adam. Alrighty, so we have a program. I'll um, run through it. Well, I'll run it and then I'll run through it. Uh, but I'd want to point out, yes, there are problems with the logic. If you've already seen it, we are using an int.parse here. And we are also not checking to see if the user has enough money to purchase their item. But regardless of those two issues, I'm going to go ahead and run the program. And it says, please enter how much money you have. I'll put in $500. It says, please enter your selection. Let's buy a Pepsi. It says, you bought a Pepsi. Please enter your select. Actually, hold on. There we go. $500. Let's buy a Pepsi. It says, you bought a Pepsi. You have $100 left. Let's buy a Coke. It says, you bought a Coke. You have $97 left. And then we can buy a bunch of Mountain Dew. Every time I buy a Mountain Dew, my money gets decremented by one. And then if I were to buy another Pepsi, it says you bought a Pepsi and then you ran out of money. So, yeah. Again, there are problems with this code, but that's not the point here. The point here is to show these two while loops and two different cases where we can use while loops to make our programs a lot nicer to use and in fact actually make writing certain programs possible. So let's run through this real fast. We have three variable de declarations at the top. A boolean specifying whether or not we have entered our money yet, which defaults to false. We have a decimal which contains how much money we have, which defaults to zero. 
And then we have another variable which we use later down in our program called menu selection, which is just an integer. We then enter our first while loop. Our first while loop says, while we have not entered money. So while has entered money equals false. So see how if you kind of read it out loud, it starts to sort of kind of sound like English. While has entered money is equal to false can be basically reworded to while we do not have money entered. We ask the user to enter their money. We then perform a decimal dot try parse, which again, the only difference between what we've seen before and this code here is that I finally did place my console read line right into the try parse. Now we can put this into a string variable if we want to. And I was doing that before just to make it very explicit about how this try parse works. But that is very cumbersome to do all the time. So instead I have right here, my console.readline is being fed directly into my try, to try parse. Then we have the out money that just tells decimal.parse what variable we want to stuff our money into. Then we check to see, okay, is has entered money equal to false? If it is, give the user a warning saying that they fail at entering money. Then, after this, go to line 20, which is the final curly brace of this block, jump all the way back to line 11, check to see if has entered money is true or false. If it's false, then run this loop again, and so on and so on and so on until has entered money is true. Has entered money will only ever be true if decimal.tryparse was successful in parsing out the money. So that's the first while loop. That's one of the most basic uses of a loop is to do perform validation on user input to say while you have failed to read instructions, print out an error and try again. The next while loop is a different kind of beast. What we have here is while money is greater than zero. This is the greater than symbol. It is the exact same symbol that you have learned in math class. It behaves in the exact same way. It's fairly self-evident what it does. But to make it absolutely explicit, what we're saying here is we will continue this loop while the value inside of money is greater than the value of zero. When we enter the loop, we do a couple things. We present the user a basic user interface. We tell them how much money they have left. We, then we then ask them to enter a selection and we give them three selections to choose from. And of course, being that I pro I'm a programmer, I started off on zero, even though I probably should have started off on one. Um, so we have zero is Coke, which is $3, one, which is Mountain Dew, which is $1, and two, which is Pepsi, which is $400. Now this is just the user interface, but the rest of this code is going to have to actually act on whatever the user chose to do. So then we ask the user to enter in a selection and we pass whatever they typed in directly into int.parse, which takes whatever text they typed in and turns it into an integer. We then check to see if the integer equals zero, one, or two. Depending on what it equals, we do different things. So if it equals zero, we inform them that they bought a Coke. Then we subtract three from how much money they have left. If any selection is one, we inform them they bought a Mountain Dew and we subtract how much money or one from how much money they have left. If it's due, they bought a Pepsi and we do by 400. After these three if statements have ran, or decided whether or not to have ran, um, the loop ends. As you see right here on line 49, this is the final curly brace of this block. We know it's the final curly brace of this block because if I click right here, notice how it gets highlighted. This up here gets highlighted too. So this is the same block. Once we hit the end of this block, we jump all the way back to while, check to see if money is, equal, is greater than zero. If it is, we run this code. Then we hit the end of the block, jump all the way back up to line 22, check the condition. Is money greater than zero? Well, let's say that they just bought a Pepsi and spent $400 on it. Um, 
they might not have any more money. So let's just say that this expression is now false, which means that because this expression is false, the while statement will no longer execute. So although execution is technically on line 22, if the while loop decides not to run anymore, it will skip over every single line of code that appears inside of the block all the way to the end to line 51, saying that you ran out of money. So um, one more quick thing. You'll notice that I'm doing money equals money minus three. I wanted for anybody you know following along and watching as I typed, I wanted people to be very clear about what this code is doing. But there is a shorthand for it. I'll introduce the shorthand for these two statements and leave this the long way. So money, we can say instead of money equals money minus three, we can say money minus equals three. The minus equals is a very special assignment operator. So it's kind of like an assignment because it has an equals right there, but it takes whatever value we have on the right hand side and subtracts it from this variable and then stores the result of that subtraction back in this variable. And that's because we have minus right there. So we can do the same thing here. Minus equals, what was this, one. And then I'll leave Pepsi the long hand. But it's the exact same code, exact same code. Now we, we do have one more thing that I would like for us to cover. And that is an introduction to arrays. Yeah. Arrays. Okay, so I have this code up here. Um, it is incomplete. You guys can go ahead and screenshot it or watch the video later because I, I will want people to see if they can complete this program. Later. Okay, never mind. So never. I'll, I'll, I'll let you off the hook this one time because we still need to... I was, well, no, I was, I was about to delete everything and start with the race. Uh, I, well, I was going to let you off the hook with the race. Since we still need to do Q&A with everyone, and we're now over two hours. I know this is lengthy, and I know we're, we're going to end up having our lecture suffer a little bit with arrays if we continue on right now. Let's go ahead. Because yeah, I actually was going to get the diagram out for that. Yeah, I know. So, so let's do it properly. It's a free class, so you know it won't hurt moving it over there. So what I want to do is take a quick break, and then when we come back from break, I will unpause the video. And actually, no, that, that, this is going to wrap it up for today then. So anything else that you want to add into this? And when I say wrap it up for today, I'm talking about the lecture portion of this class. We'll go into all the Q&A that you guys have here in just a few minutes. Um, the class has run a lot longer than um, was expected. But at, at the same time, it's a lot of content that we're wanting to get across. And, um, and, and look on the bright side. It was Nelson teaching, not me, because we'd still be on the, the first part of the lecture because I like to be very <laughs> thorough, sorry. Not saying that Nelson's not, I just like diagramming out everything. Okay, so for today we talked about ints, floats, doubles, decimals. Um, we reintroduced booleans and strings. We talked about casting implicit and explicit um, conversions. We talked about the parse methods and the convert methods. And we talked or introduced while loops. And we have a very simple example of some some very handy while loops. So yeah, I just, again, I want to, um, before I say again what the homework is, um, I want to make everybody very clear that we are using the console. And we are writing very simple pieces of software that run in black and white text. It's not very exciting. but. If you were to take this, these concepts and go into something like Unity or a web application or a desktop application, you would be writing the exact same kinds of things. You'd still be writing while loops, you'd still be writing if statements. It's just instead of while money is greater than zero, it might say while your health is greater than zero or something like that. But the concepts are the same and I don't want people to get discouraged about the fact that we're in the console. Okay, so um, homework. I wrote out a very simple program here because I wanted another example of a while loop that wasn't just about validation and I wanted to make that example available to everybody. However, we have some problems with this code that we've already actually solved in previous bits of this lesson and last week's lesson. 
First thing is, is our menu selection uses an int.parse. It does not use a uh, int.tryparse. And if we were to type in text into that selection, we would get an exception. The second problem with this code is going to be a little bit more tricky and it's going to have to require people to start thinking about logic in a more abstract way. What I want people to be able to do is I want this program to not allow a person to purchase a Coke, a Mountain Dew, or a Pepsi if they cannot afford it. And I want this while loop to be adjusted to make it so that if they ever become so poor that they can't afford any of the items, that the program will exit. So does that sound good? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's, actually, that's very easy. All right. Well, unless you want to add something, like um, we can throw in, um, uh, I mean, I'm sure we can throw in at least a delegate or two. <laughs> nice. No, that'll work just fine for for now. And I mean, because obviously Alrighty. once we get into arrays and all, then we could have, you know, had an inventory where you've got all the stuff that you've purchased in the inventory and, you know, we could have had all sorts of fun. But... Yeah, there's lots of ways that you can expand this program, um, especially next week when we start talking about fun stuff. Exactly. So, all right, as we had mentioned last week, the way homework is going to work, first of all, there's been a bunch of people that have asked for this code. We, we don't pass out code. We ask that you guys type it out because, again, this is an, an introductory class, and so the only people that we're really catering to are our beginners and our beginners need to get in there and write code. That's extremely important. And they need to, to trouble, troubleshoot the, uh, the problems that they introduce with casing issues or leaving off terminators or using the wrong symbols, etc. So that's very important. So no, we, we're not going to be passing out code in this particular case. That's the first thing. The second thing with homework, as I had mentioned last week, is that we are not going to be grading homework for the simple fact that we could literally receive a lot that would really inundate us so that we couldn't do anything else. What we will do is at the beginning of the class next week is we will walk through doing the homework ourselves and say this is how it should have been done. Now you have the forms over on 3dbuzz.com that I would like to encourage those of you that run into problems to make use of. There's C-sharp programming forms over there, and we've got some fantastic regulars on 3D Buzz that do an awesome job at helping people out. So if you get stuck, make a post over there and get help. So that's pretty much it. Anything that you want to add to that? Oh, Lacey's laughing at something. What are you laughing at? No, it seems good. When you learn code, just chew gum. When you use the code, you choose the same flavor. You will remember what you learned. <laughs> nice. Okay, so let's go ahead and go on break right now. And when we come back in 10 minutes, we will pick back up, and then we'll just open it up for Q&A, and we'll go forward with that. Also, I'll be posting this video up, the lecture portion, which is already almost at 2 hours and 15 minutes, mostly pure lecture, over on 3D Buzz here in just a little while. And for those of you that have managed to um, hang in there with us throughout the odd midnight hours, congratulations, you guys rock. So let me go ahead and pause the video. Actually, stop the video. That concludes this video. Yes, lecture's over. Thanks a lot, guys. We'll see you next week when things get much more interesting. Goodbye. See ya.